Okay, welcome everybody. It's um, 10.03, Friday, August 9th, 2024. We're here for a budget workshop with the prosecuting attorney's office. Uh, our, our goal would be to walk through the, the budget line by line and just answer any questions or ask any questions or from the commission, from yourselves, from the clerk, and just try to make sure we're all on, on one page. We're not trying to make any major changes or anything today, but we want to make sure that we have all questions answered. And then this will go uh, back to the budget officer and you'll be publishing next week, right? Week after, isn't it? Week after. I think you got two weeks again. Yeah, I think it's the week after because the way it fell. Oh. The next week I'm going in for a battery. You're going in for a battery, which we have worn out this week. Yes. So, okay, so without further ado, just turning to, I'm, I'm going by this sheet that's hot off the press. Mine's still warm. So we'll uh, go down this line by line. And if anybody here at the table, just feel free to, you know, if there's a line item you want to discuss or bring up or question or have an idea on. That sound right, Commissioner? That's okay by me. Thank All right. You. And Mr. Chair, just so the board's aware, within my presentation, I've highlighted and identified the couple of lines that the department's request and the budget officer's request was different. So that way we could talk about them and I've got some detail in the presentation. So would you like to start with the presentation? I can. That I think that the budget worksheet itself, hopefully, should we should move through that fairly quickly. There wasn't a ton of line items that the budget officer and my department disagreed on. Um, and so those, I think, will be fairly, fairly quick, but, yeah. You want to just run through the budget first, and then we'll, we can do, we can do it either way. Your, we'll just, your preference. Whatever you want. It's your guys' show. I just All put right. together the presentation every year to try to help and, and assist. And as you guys know, I usually give a brief summary of what is going on in my office, too, because that usually lends itself to some of the discussions about what in the budget's important. It would be helpful to hear the presentation first. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, go I'll ahead. jump in. Uh, so first off, um, as you guys know, one of the things I like doing for purposes of our budget presentation discussions is to actually discuss, you know, what our successes have been in the office and what our struggles have been in the office. And so uh, I'll start us first today looking at some of what I would call our successes. Um, a year in review, looking at our highlights. Uh, first, we expanded our internship program again, uh, including a Rule 226 intern that actually relocated to the Silver Valley temporarily for the summer. So uh, talking about this, this mindset of how do we integrate the next generation of working professionals. One of the pieces is trying to make them feel a part of the community. We convinced one to actually relocate this summer. And as a Rule 226 intern, for those that don't know what that definition is, it's a uh, limited law license that actually re allows an individual who has a bachelor's degree plus an additional two years toward their doctorate degree to be able to perform certain functions that an attorney can perform under the supervision of an attorney. Um, for the second year in a row, we resolved a high profile murder case without the need for a jury trial, which anyone that's been involved in the cost associated with a a uh, homicide jury trial knows that uh, they are, those expenses are high. Uh, we obtained scholarship funding to cover the cost associated with multiple employees trainings this last year. Uh, my chief deputy prosecutor, Ms. Brittany Jacobs, actually wrote that scholarship application that got approved and that covered all the costs for two separate employees to do their training this last year. So that was a huge benefit and hopefully will result in a little surplus that will be in our budget uh, at the end of the year. Um, we rolled out our ILED diversion program on January 1, which for uh, anyone in the room that's not familiar, uh, it's really a new diversionary structure. Um, and I just found out last week that Canyon County down in the Boise area caught wind of our structure, asked for all of our documents, and are in the process of starting a program modeled after ours. So even the even the big players are looking at what we're doing, and it's uh, it's having an impact. Can we charge them? <laughs> it's a labor of love. Uh, two of our prosecutors, which I think this 
fact is kind of neat. Uh, actually received state level attorney awards for government attorneys from the IMA. Um, the IMA gives out uh, a total of four attorney awards to attorneys around the state. And not only did two of those awards come back to North Idaho, they literally came back to two of your attorneys in this very courthouse. So I thought that, that was a pretty cool accomplishment. Um, last, although we're still well above the state averages for overdose deaths in Shoshone County, uh, for the first year in recent years, we actually saw our number uh, stop climbing and start to drop on a per capita basis. So I think that that's, that's a good statistic for us. I was happy to, to finally see that. Um, looking or juxtaposing that against some of the adversities that I would say my office is, is facing, continual vacancies within our deputy prosecutor positions continue to, to put strain on our office. Um, Shoshone County experienced a difficult homicide case for the fourth year in a row this last year. Um, complex civil litigation continues to persist and costs uh, of contracting with outside legal counsel when it's needed is getting more and more expenses. The caseload numbers within the county continue to rise and we're seeing an increase in the severity or the nature of those cases. Looking at how I would analyze the health of my office right now. Um, for those that have sat through my budget presentations, know I can break this up into two primary categories that I think impact health the most. And uh, I do so in, in really kind of a three-tiered category. Uh, those areas that I think are healthy, those areas that are tolerable, but I'd like to see improvement on, and those areas that I don't think are sustainable long-term for the county. Um, I've broken it up into both workload and pay, and you'll see uh, my subjective opinion about where I think my office is at on each of those. Uh, I would say the most significant concern for my office uh, continues to be workload. I think that that's the most significant when we look at our inability to fill certain vacancies. I think if vacancies were filled and I could get my office to full staff, hopefully it would uh, have a significant impact on this. When we analyze what is the cause for our increased workload that we're seeing in Shoshone, um, I've identified what I believe are the four most prominent contributors. I'd say civil litigation is a prominent contributor. Uh, search warrants and matters that are related to search warrants is a significant contributor. The sheer number of case filings and the type of cases, uh, I would say, is um, having a, a big impact on that. These are our search warrant numbers processed. You'll see that uh, we were on a pretty drastic four-year uh, trend. Uh, we talked about that number last year in 2023. Um, I think I had projected it maybe at 42 last year and we wound up at 44 by the end of the year. Uh, this year I pulled our numbers as of mid-year and based on where we're at mid-year, we're looking at 38. So we're still very high compared to historical averages for search warrants. The civil demands, these are areas that you as county commissioners are probably more familiar with than the criminal side of things because uh, some of these matters come before you Obviously, you're aware of what some of those claims are and you're aware of um, some of those more complex matters. One of the areas that we'll talk about uh, in just a minute is in the bottom left-hand corner, those post-conviction relief cases. Uh, and I'll discuss why I think that that's a significant impact. Um, Idaho has 44 counties. And uh, if we break up those counties into quartiles of, of uh, one-fourth, we're looking at a cross-section of the 11 counties that are closest to you for your court town. Uh, what I did was I went ahead and I pulled the data for uh, caseload numbers that's reported by the state for each of the counties. And I took the five above us and the five below us. And so I put them here on our screen. You can see Shoshone County, I put right in the middle. And as you can identify from that curve, these are the other 10 counties that are closest to us. And for context, I, I showed where we're at pay-wise for our elected position, at least. Uh, and you can see out of that group of four, we're by and far the lowest. Here's our four-year trend for caseloads. This number uh, is a number that it's kind of difficult for us to run, but essentially we take and we combine all of the uh, felonies, misdemeanors, and infractions and come up with a 
total cumulative criminal caseload. Um, this isn't a number necessarily that's tracked by the state, so we have to track it ourselves. Um, when I say tracked by the state, I'm sure it is in some metric. It's just not readily available to me. And so um, this is our four-year trend using the numbers from the end of last year. And as you can tell, we're, we continue to climb every year. Uh, last year, I think I had projected that I thought our year would end around 2088. And by the end of the year, we had even exceeded that. Um, this piece is interesting and I'll actually pull it off the screen just for a second to say, when I'm out and about in the community and people want to talk to me about, you know, what our criminal caseload numbers are in Shoshone County, uh, and, and I have this conversation with them, typically what I get in response is, uh, yeah, that's, it's going up everywhere, crime's up everywhere. Uh, and that's typically what you hear, right? And uh, this year, for the first time, Idaho released a new data reporting system for the courts that allows you to kind of have access to the entire state's uh, reporting all in one spot. And I pulled those numbers and I was actually shocked to know that the state averages for criminal caseload is actually going down on a four-year trend. Um, so we're not following the trend. We're, we're actually going against the trend. Jeff. Yeah, the, uh, is that 2,167 of the actual filed court cases? So that is actual filed court cases for misdemeanors and felonies as the state's reporting them. In the, the 2,167, uh, I, I apologize, I didn't hear the number you referenced. Yeah, the 2,167. The 2,167 is the number from us looking at the total case files that were filed. What I've done here uh, on this next slide is I've removed the infractions. So on this next slide, I'm going to show you just the more serious types of cases. So just the misdemeanors and felonies. Okay. We take all the traffic stuff out of it. Just the misdemeanors and felonies, we'll see that on our four-year trend, we actually had a slight decrease, even though the total number of cases was continuing to trend up. We had a slight decrease in the numbers that were just misdemeanors and felonies. Uh, and then this last year, you see, boom, we jump back up significantly. So um, 872 cases. Yeah, so 872 misdemeanors and felonies within the county. Uh, so when we talk about you know the nature of cases shifting to be more serious, um, this is what that data actually shows. Uh, Post-conviction relief cases, the, these are kind of an anomaly. A lot of people don't even know what this concept is. Even some attorneys have never heard of it. A post-conviction relief case is what happens when an individual, typically a high profile case, um, proceeds forward on the case. They get to the end of the case. Oftentimes resources have to be expended all the way to the end in pursuing a jury trial. You get a conviction, the jury finds them guilty. Uh, they'll do a Rule 35 motion for appeal. They'll do a state appeal. Sometimes they have an opportunity to do more than one state appeal. And then after they've exhausted all of their state appeals, they can come back and they can file a civil lawsuit against the county, in essence, in order to challenge the entirety of their criminal proceedings. Uh, Post-conviction relief cases in most instances are pretty rare. I'd say during my time in Shoshone County, usually we have about one a year. Um, and you'll see here, uh, 2020, we actually had two of them that year. 2021, we had one. 2022, we had one. Last year, we had five of these babies. And to talk about the significance of that, I asked my uh, chief deputy, I said, hey, Brittany, do you have a post-conviction relief case you've worked on recently that you have a case filing in court? She said, yeah, actually, I have one on my desk right now. And I said, can you grab it just so we can all look at the volume of it? And that's your case file. So that's the case file here in red of one single post-conviction relief case. Uh, so we're talking typically thousands of pages of work product that you've got to work through for a post-conviction relief case. Um, Shifting now to how those things impact our budget and where our budget's at. Uh, in the budget packets you guys have, um, you'll see the FY24 budget totals and you'll see your FY25 budget totals. Uh, for the PA's office, I think these numbers are gonna look maybe a little different than some of the other departments. And a uh, primary reason why is through the course of the discussion, uh, our county clerk would like to see 
some of our grant fund allocations specifically called out within the budget. And so there's going to be some new budget lines that are showing up in the A budget this year. Uh, those budget lines are budget lines that historically in the past, since that money is essentially passed through, meaning it's expended, but then grant funds are coming in. So it's essentially a sum zero. Uh, in past years of doing the budget, uh, that money has not been reflected in the A budget. Uh, so it didn't show up. Um, through discussions that I've had with, with our clerk and, and with Timmy, I understand that for reporting purposes, it's helpful for them if it shows up in the A budget and they can say, hey, it's associated with the line. Um, so it's taken a little work for us to try to iron out the kinks of what it'll look like. But ultimately, in the FY25 budget, you guys are going to see a number of new line items that are essentially passed through line items for grants. Um, and as a result, you're going to see uh, a good portion of that FY25 budget increase associated with those line items that previously were passed through. Um, the reality of those is those are offset by revenue that comes in. Um, and so from the clerk's perspective, she's got a handle on what it looks like behind the scenes. Um, but suffice it to say that if you look at those two numbers, I, I would argue it shows that there's a whole bunch of increases, maybe in dollar amount, um, that were always there in essence. They weren't reflecting the budget though. And so your, your total will look a little different. Uh, if we actually look at what the budget request increases from my office are, uh, we've got it here. So this was the budget request increase form that uh, my office submitted. At the time that we submitted our budget request, um, I think the county was still in a state of uncertainty in a lot of regards. Uh, I know some of the advice that was passed on to the various departments were uh, try to limit your budgets as much as possible until we have a better handle on what the situation or status is of concerns over budget deficits. Um, we were asked to not include a, a COLA initially and we were asked to essentially not increase anything that wasn't absolutely necessary uh, and so our office filled this out at that point in time with those admonishments in mind i say that because if you were asking me as the budget officer ben what do you think your budget actually needs long term to be sustainable i would say there are some areas of my budget that if i'm looking for long-term sustainability i would have more increases in this is really kind of the bare minimum of what i thought would be necessary in light of the concerns, particularly the, the ones early this year. As such, if you add up those items, you'll see that the actual budget increase request was only $9,600 from my office. Looking at our anticipated revenue, uh, you'll see that on that revenue uh, worksheet that was provided, uh, our anticipated revenue for FY25 is going up. Uh, the significant contributor of that you're going to see in uh, source line 4A, and you'll see that we put in and, and received a request for an increase in our stop grant. That increase was roughly 15% or so, uh, so it went up $10,000. And so you'll see that increase reflected in stop grant funding that will help offset some of the expenses of my office. Additionally, you'll notice in 4B, my office has put in as a placeholder the prosecutor revenue, which is generated from the City of Wallace prosecution contract for criminal prosecution. Um, it's my understanding, although I'm not a part of that process, that that contract is currently being negotiated right now. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you know more about the status of that, but it's my understanding that we're in negotiations on that. So as a placeholder, I just used last year's number for budgeting purposes, but that may go up. So the actual FY25 uh, anticipated revenue for my office, assuming that a new contract is negotiated and raises are built into that, will actually be more than the number reflected. Even though those numbers that I uh, have pointed out for the various reasons uh, maybe aren't an exact reflection of the actual increases, my goal has always been I want to strive to try to finish uh, every year and go into the next with my anticipated revenue increasing more than my budget increases. And using the numbers, uh, even the ones that include the new line items for grants, uh, I think we still very much met that goal. 
looking at some of the individual budget line items where there were uh, differences between my department and our budget officer. Um, the overtime one, I think we've sorted out, so that should all be good. Those line items are reflected now. Um, and I think that you guys will see uh, two separate line items. One is going to be 408000 on the first page. And that is overtime that's specifically associated with the stop grant. So as part of the stop grant, the stop grant says we want you to dedicate specific resources within your office to improving the prosecution and management of cases that involve victims. And as such, during the original grant proposal, we, we indicated that we didn't necessarily have the staffing to take on the additional work, so it would involve overtime. So they gave us a specific allocation that's dedicated to the overtime that would be needed for that grant. And so you guys will see that in 408000. And that 6,065 number should be pretty much exact. I think that's what we expect to see come in. Uh, the second overtime item is 408010. And that's actually going to be on the very top of page two. So if you're looking at the, the new sheet that our uh, Madam Clerk brought in, you'll see that line item. Um, you'll see where we've got the request of $5,000 for that, and that's consistent with what we've budgeted for in the past. I know last year we actually decreased that line item. So if you look at where we were in FY23, we had 7,500 in that line item last year due to budget cuts, we reduced it to 5,000. So it would be uh, our recommendation that we at least hold that number. So what, what, what was the heading in that? Uh, so that's going to be on the top page two, and on your budget worksheet, the new one that's just been provided, the account number will be 408010. Second page. 0010. Mm -hmm. Second page. Second page. I'm trying to work off my other one. That I had yeah, that's a new line item. Okay. Um, moving on through some of the other uh, components within the budget, uh, line item 439000 for travel. Uh, you'll note that for FY24, my office had budgeted 7000 for travel. Uh, based upon what we're seeing with inflation, what we're seeing with costs, uh, I anticipated that for FY25, I think that number will be around 8000 um, Currently in the budget, we're we're about to take a hit for some travel uh, in the next two weeks. So uh, August is when the IPAA, the Prosecuting Attorneys Association of the state, holds their annual training for the, the prosecutors. Um, and so August, we usually are hit with uh, a bunch of expenses related to travel and to training. And so those numbers will certainly have gone up by the end of the month. Um, my department request uh, reflects that. And I had dropped it because I took the average. Okay. So that's a decision. <laughs> yeah. Point that one out. Yeah, nine one year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next line item was the line item for telephone. Um, you'll see this number's kind of been all over the board. Sometimes it's it's tough to know. We've got contracts that are out there. Sometimes the contracts change mid year on us. And I would say that I really need some copies of contracts to verify that because. I dropped it because I didn't have like some of the information regarding phones. So if you could get that to me and because it was charged on the cards and get that resolved, I'd be appreciative. You got it. We'll do our best. Well, I'll have to make note of that. Yep. Um, so looking at, you know, this telephone expenditure, uh, based upon where we were at this last year, I anticipated that uh, we would need another $1,000 in that line item for FY25. Uh, and so that's the reason for the increase for 461. Um, expert fees. Expert fees. Uh, two years ago, we had budgeted $10,000 for expert fees. Um, last year, during our time of budget cuts, we actually cut that in half. So. The DOCC decided to reduce that number down to five. Um, and the actual for FY24, I'm happy to report to you all that it's zero. My hope would be that I can come before this board every year and say that I made it through another year without needing experts. Uh, that's my goal. The reality of it is, though, when we have high-profile cases in Choshone County, 
things like you know murders, rapes, etc. Um, experts are a necessary requirement to be able to prosecute those cases. And when we do have one of those, if we don't have money in our budget that's allocated and identified for expert fees, I think it puts the county in a really tough spot to try to figure out where that money's going to come from later. And so we reduced it down to five last year. In my department request, I went ahead and held that number at five for expert fees. Um, but that's the reason for that. Can I answer to that? Yeah. The budget officer just so that. You bet. Okay. On this, you haven't used it for quite a while, which we agree. I left it out because I know that I have in county reserve some money that if you come into that spot of needing it, it can be approved by the commissioners. That's why I left it out. So if you don't, you haven't used it for so long, then that's why. So if you needed it further down the road, they would have another option. Okay. So, if that helps. Do we have to open up the budget for that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just one. No. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. It's all inclusive. Do you really have to open up the budget? No. <laughs> That's what I just asked you. No, so. no that, that is in our county general. We have that reserve line item. And you can move it from that because it's all inclusive in. Okay, because this is in. It, current expense. And maybe the last piece I'll leave you with here, and, and you know, Flo might have some better numbers on this as well. But you know, I recall having this conversation with Tammy, you know, back in FY twenty three. Her and I had decided on the ten thousand dollar number, and then uh, you know, last year when we dropped it down to five, one of the one of the realities of this is realistically the cost of experts, the cost associated with experts likely will far exceed this if we actually needed one, right? So if I came to you guys and I needed a forensic expert for a child l, &L case that's going to come in and testify, uh, that expert's probably going to cost us between 10 and 20 grand by the time the trial's done. Uh, so this number, in my honest opinion, is fairly low. I know the clerk's provided some context for maybe an alternate option for you. But I would say that if my office actually needed an expert, we'd probably blow through this amount, even the amount I've put in there. Um, the training line item. So uh, training, it's a necessary evil. It's what allows us to stay abreast of what we need in order to do our jobs. Uh, for attorneys, uh, training is not only a priority, but it's a literal requirement. We lose our bar license if we don't do enough training. Uh, and so training is one of those things that my office is always going to have to make sure we're budgeting toward. As I alluded to uh, just a moment ago, uh, our training for prosecuting attorneys um, usually always takes a, a nice little hit in August because that's when our annual summer conference is. And um, when we look at that line item, I approach it every year knowing that I'm usually under budget on it. And from that perspective, I start every year having conversations with my office staff and with my attorneys to say, hey, we're not going to have enough money in our budget to cover all the training we need. So we need to be looking at grants, scholarships, ways to save money, sleep on a friend's couch when you fly out of town, whatever, right? Um, which those of you that know me know I do my absolute best to do just that. Um, the training budget for this year, I thought I would point out something that I think is illustrative of that fact. So right now, if you look at our FY24, and I've got this up on the screen, you'll see we've got 4,500 budgeted. Right now we're reflecting actual expenditures of 1,500 and some change. What's not reflected in that is the fact that if we had to pay for actual cost of training that my office has incurred so far this year, we would be adding on another almost four grand for the two scholarships we wrote and got approved for, which covered almost all the costs. And then the stop grant, which has a component built into the stop grant that we are able to allocate specifically toward training. And so if I'm looking at what is the actual cost of training to my office, it's significantly above the 4,500. And in any given year, if I'm not successful in being proactive and trying to write for scholarships and things like that, um, 
we'll either have to leave people out of training or uh, be over budget on this line item. So the 4,500 is kind of the trying to plan for being able to be successful and going out and getting things like scholarships and grants. Uh, witness fees. Um, this is another one of those line items that uh, I think I want to try to end every year showing that we came in way under budget. It's my goal on this. Witness fees are directly associated with contested hearings, um, prelims, jury trials, motions to, su to suppress, things like that. Fortunately for us, when our key witnesses are law enforcement officers, we get to keep that all in-house, right? If I've got to have an ISP officer or a county sh sheriff's officer come testify, they're doing that on their own dime. We usually don't incur much for witness fees related to those components. When we get a case where our witnesses <coughs> are not county employees or other government employees that do the work on their own dime, uh, this witness fee category can take a huge hit. To give one good example of this, right now I've got a pending homicide case in my office. It is set for prelim next month. If that prelim goes, I'm going to need how many witnesses flown in from California flown? Side two or three. Um, I think there'll be at least three. At least three. So now I've got to pay to have out of state service of process for those witnesses. I've got to coordinate how we're going to get them here in order for the case to proceed. Um, all of these components that go into those higher profile cases. Um, my hope is to try to find ways to resolve these cases outside of the courtroom to save our county taxpayer dollars and to still reach the same ends of justice. That said, we don't always accomplish that goal. And when we don't, having sufficient allocation in our budget to still proceed forward on a major case instead of, instead of having to go back to a victim or a victim's family and say, hey, sorry, we can't prosecute this case because we don't have the money to prosecute it. Uh, I think that that's an important consideration for us. And um, that's why the, the number's where it's at from my perspective. And now, just, just a quick question on that. Yeah. And when those guys come over from California, you're talking about the travel and mm -hmm. uh, hotel and stuff here for... That, that's what that, that cost would be incurred? Uh, it, it certainly can be, right? So every case you analyze differently, every case you analyze who's necessary, uh, who's preferred, who's desired, uh, and you're on that analysis. Sometimes we send a subpoena to somebody out of state and we tell them, hey, you're required to show up for court on Tuesday, September 9th. Uh, and they get that subpoena and say, I don't have my ticket to Idaho, so you won't see me. And then as a prosecutor, we've got to figure out, okay, well, how do we get them to Idaho um, if they're going to refuse to, to comply? Um, and, you know, to fast forward and what that analysis looks like, sometimes we make those decisions in-house. In fact, Brittany has a case that she just had a hearing on this week uh, where we've got a case that's set for prelim. Her primary and key witness is located right now in the state of Texas. Um, we reached out to the witness. They said, I don't have money to get here from Texas. Brittany filed a motion with the court to try to request that they could appear by Zoom for the hearing to save us the travel costs. Uh, the court said, nope, this is a hearing that uh, ascertaining the credibility of a witness is a primary component, and therefore I want to see them face to face in the courtroom. And so the judge granted us a continuance uh, on the matter. Um, I think she bumped it out, uh, reset it for prelim, and said, I'm going to buy you a couple weeks to figure out how you're going to get them here. And so that's where that case is currently at. And now Brittany's working with Flo to try to figure out what we're going to do with that case. So, uh, Computer operations. Um, this is a line item that uh, I think can fluctuate or go up and down based on where we're at and other parts of the budget based upon, um, you know, really depreciation values of, of equipment and things like that. Realistically, you want to be able to keep uh, your computer systems within your office up and running. Um, as such, you should be replacing them in regular intervals. Um, sometimes you get to the end 
the budget cycle and you realize things are really tight, maybe you've gone over in other areas and then you say, hey, you know what, this computer might be five years old, but it's not going to be able to get replaced this year. Uh, and so you save some money in the budget. Um, some years you get to the end and you go over budget. Uh, so we're taking that into consideration while still trying to account for inflation. Uh, the cost of computer operations continue to go up. The cost that the county pays in um, our employee or subcontractor that comes in and assists with computer operations um, when there's troubleshooting that needs to be done, when there's new software equipment that needs to be installed. Um, when you have things, uh, one of our computers this last year actually got hacked midway through the year. I don't know if you all recall that at all, um, but it got hacked midway through the year. And actually, a Shoshone County uh, server actually shut down the state. In essence, the state said, hey, we're stopping all emails from the county of Shoshone right now until they get this figured out. Um, we lost our ability to file things temporarily. We had to call BJN on an emergency basis to try to fix things like that. There's been some really bad horse stories that have happened recently um, with things like uh, terrorist attacks using cybersecurity. Uh, and so you just never know when those things are going to hit you. So I think that our computer operations take into account the cost of having uh, BJ regularly manage, update, and maintain the operations too. And uh, those costs, I, I would argue, are going up with inflation. So, I have a question on that. Yeah, Jeff. Now the computer operations, I don't see any other any other uh, categories for anything else. So that computer operations would be purchasing computers. That would also be the software, which which you what software publications and things like that. Is that all inclusive into that? Um. Like if you, know, you see what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. If you yeah. use okay. Adobe, you're going to have to start paying the monthly fee. If you use Microsoft, mm -hmm. you're going to have to start paying the monthly fee. Does that all go into this? I think most so of we them. We probably do. should, what Flo and I were just saying, we probably should go in some line items and define and open up so that it can yeah. be read easily. I think we're going to have to do that countywide because right now Microsoft is going to start charging. A monthly fee. You're not going to be able to buy mm -hmm. the program, so you're going to be you're going to be renting it. So and Adobe did the same thing. Adobe, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we need a, a different line item for hardware, software, however we want to do that, so we can figure yeah. out. Because that's going to well, be some of it is regular they have their own system. <laughs> also, so that's why we need to address this line item because. And I mean, I've got 6,000 here, and I'm questioning it myself, you know, and going, hmm. But yeah, you're looking what you have to pay. Mm -hmm. like, well, yeah. Yeah. So, Flo and I'll get together and define that, make some new line items so that yeah, it'll be so easier to read. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, BJ can give us some hard numbers and or at least okay. some hard estimated numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll know what we're working with there, yeah. Um, I think I've also got, if my memory serves me correctly, I think I've got, um, well, I'll jump to this line. So we've got new equipment and furnishings. Uh, technically, I think that, you know, whether or not the equipment is a computerized piece of equipment or not a computerized piece of equipment, may dictate whether it falls into one category or the other. Um, items such as new equipment and furnishing is usually one of those where I have my office staff kind of table their requests throughout the year when it's not absolutely necessary. Like, is your chair leaning to the side three inches or did the legs fall off completely, right? If the legs fell off completely, we go ahead and buy the chair. If the chair's leaning to the side, depending on where we're at in the budget, maybe that's something where I'm saying, hey, Make a note, write it down. Let's try to get toward the end of the budget year and see where we're at. Obviously, this is something that's going to need to be replaced, um, but whether or not we can afford to replace it in this budget year or have to you know, wait until October 1 to do it, sometimes is a strategic decision that I you know, make as a department head to try to make sure that my budget always stays under. As such, you'll see on our uh, line item for new equipment, our actual for FY24, uh, nothing's been spent out of it yet. That's my goal. 
Uh, we certainly do have some items within my office that I think need to be replaced. I know we've got, um, you know, one computer, for instance, and I'm, I'm just throwing this out because I'm aware of it, uh, whether or not that falls under the computer operations or it falls under here, um, you know, we can decide that. But I'm just using that as an example of something that I haven't replaced yet this year. My hope is to wait till the end of the budget year and make sure we're going to be under uh, before we actually pull the trigger on that. Uh, and so that's the reason for that. Um, I did ask for a, a small increase in this line item, just based on where I think we're at inflation-wise. Uh, certainly, when you know the county's analyzing its budgets, you guys are trying to plan both short-term and long-term. Uh, and so, long-term planning-wise, we don't want to get too far behind depreciation schedules or let things degrade too much. Um, so I would like to have some money in there to use at our disposal when things are are falling apart or breaking or need replaced otherwise. Okay. Uh, that same notion, I think, applies to office equipment. Um, so once again, the Madam Clerk's earlier point, whether or not we want to start redefining some of these and give them more specific boundaries, I'll defer to the BOCC on that. Uh, but for the same reason, I usually try to wait until the end of the budget year before I pull any money out of this line item that I don't absolutely need. You guys will notice FY23, mm -hmm. uh, right? So we budgeted for 2,500. I got to the end of the year and we were sitting well, so I was able to catch back up on maybe some of those items that we had punted down the road a little bit. Um, I've held steady on that line. I'm not asking for any change to it. I'm just asking to hold steady on it. I think it's an appropriate amount um, and uh, I think it's workable for my office. Uh, that said, um, you know, I'll circle all the way back to uh, really where I approach our budget goals for my department. Um, my department specifically is unique in that it answers uh, both to the public and providing services to the public and internally in that my office also provides services to the other departments. And so uh, some departments are almost entirely just public service or internal service. My department's kind of a hybrid. It's kind of both components of it. And so as I'm analyzing my budget, I'm trying to account for both of those pieces while still ensuring that I've got sufficient capacity within my budget to comply with my obligations under Idaho Code. Um, recapping where we're at on some of those budget totals, as I started with, you guys go back and you look at my actual budget request. You look at the individual line items uh, for my budget. Uh, I'm only asking for $9,600 total. Um, realistically, if I was trying to estimate numbers that gave my office the, uh, the security it needs, I think that my office is very vulnerable if we were to have a major case that went to trial right now. If we had a homicide case that proceeded to a jury trial, my budget would, it would be in trouble. Um, now, ideas like the clerk has, has raised already about dipping the general fund. Um, it's not dipping. It is their line item. It's called reserve. Okay. <laughs> Grabbing money out of our reserve um, uh, to help uh, offset that. Um, that's obviously a, a good component to have in mind there. Um, but if, if I'm being candid with the BOCC, I would be ris remiss if I didn't recognize the fact that one of those cases hit our county, which we've been having one every year, and we've been really fortunate the last two years that we've been able to resolve those with relatively little cost considering. Um, I, I think that that's something we just have to be aware of as we're analyzing these budgets. Um, you know, I'll finish maybe with this last plug-in. I know that uh, last year for the county employees across the county, uh, I know we, we froze wages. Um, I know we really were trying hard to get to the end of the road to try to figure, figure out where we're at budget-wise and to identify where certain deficits are at or the amount of those deficits or, or uh, whatnot. And I would advocate on behalf of county employees beyond just my office um, that if this commission gets to the end of the budget road and you identify that you've got sufficient space, I really would encourage the BOCC um, for your county employees to consider revisiting whether or not even a 1% COLA might be doable for your county employees. Uh, and I've taken that into account in minimizing the actual request of increases from other line items in my budget. So um, that's what I've got for you all today.
Okay. I tried to highlight the things from your presentation so we could go back over and make a discussion. The first one I had was 439 travel. Um, it would appear based on the last couple of years of travel. I'd be willing to put that back to eight thousand dollars. Okay, I agree. Okay. Heather, you got that? Yes, sir. Okay. The second one I have highlighted is telephone. And Peggy, hey, did you say you guys were gonna work yeah. on We'd have to work on that because there there's some things I'm not understanding with some of the stuff that came down to accounts payable. Okay. Okay. Well, and we're working on that now. So. Okay. So we'll just allow them to work on that? Yep. Okay. I just have a okay. question mark next to that yeah, line okay. item. The next one I had marked was the expert fees for 5000 um, Hearing the testimony that, you know, it, it, it would easily exceed even that. I don't know. I think it'd be wise to keep 5000 there. Okay. I, I would agree. And looking at looking at the budget, there doesn't doesn't look like they're they're going over on a bunch of bunch of items. I see professional services this year were going over quite a bit. Yeah, but could you, if you need me to chat about that? I can't. Yeah, yeah. So our professional services. I don't know if you all recall, but uh, early on this year we had uh, one of our major civil cases, a road validation case. So is that coming? Is that coming? But but that's coming from another part, right? Uh, so realistically speaking, as we analyzed it, with my office being as understaffed as it yes. was, I offered to the VOCC to allow you guys to pay that out of my budget this year. Okay, so um, you come out of that that. Uh, third or fourth position is what we kind of... I mean, at the end of the day, it should all more than balance. Um, that amount should come in underneath okay. that amount of that vacancy that we okay. haven't been able to fill. Okay. Um, and, and I did that understanding that yeah. I had had the vacancy for quite some time even at that point. Yep. So and I, I think I remember some sweet talks about that. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to... Yeah. Because it, you know, it shows right there. So I just wanted to make sure that that's... I said that's the only thing, I, and that's the only reason why. But everything else looks like it's you know tracked and fine, except for that one item, which I know what it is. It's has to do with the case that we have with the Supreme Court. Right now. Yeah, it's, so. and that's you know, that's one that's attorney in one case, it. and so that kind of puts it into perspective what the cost of you know legal services are if we have to go outside of our office even for one case. Exactly. So, okay. so I would agree with that. Mr. Jones. That's okay. Okay. Uh, so expert fees back to 5,000. Uh, training, I had that one highlighted. And based on it, it, the history of it, I think 4,500 is is fair to keep it at I, I would agree based on the history of the actuals of the previous years uh, before this year. You okay there, Heather? Yes. Uh, uh, witness fees, uh, I mean, same same logic. Uh, if we had to have it, we'd have to have it. Okay. It makes sense to keep that at two thousand. I would agree. And computer operations. Just looking at the history of expense spent there, I think forty five hundred is reasonable. Based on I, I I would agree, but I'd like to um, on those. I I'd like to kind of clean this up a little bit on the, you know, have like hardware. I, I think we need to do it. Yeah, and, and then we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll get an we'll actual get budget to, to flow through. I think we need to make sure that we're, our um, software that we're going to have to start paying for, I mean, it's going to be continual, mm -hmm. continual payments, maybe have an extra line for that so that you know that, okay, this is coming out. Instead of wrapping it all into one, then you know that okay, I got this much to go spend on a computer. I've got to buy a computer for this, and so you're not hit with. So can we get with the, the clerk on that and kind of figure out the average and maybe add a new a new. Uh, and I can get with her as well as exactly what we have to spend on certain programs on our yeah. office too. So yeah, I think there needs to be a separate one thing than that mm -hmm. so that we can mm -hmm. county sure wide. That so if we split, just out of curiosity and, and for conversation's sake, if we split, for instance, computer operations into computer hardware and computer software, yeah. would 
would that count for? I believe that would be yeah, great. I think okay. that's a better yeah. cleaning that up. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna have. So then, out of the proposed forty-five hundred, Flo and I can work on figuring out how much of that we think should be allocated for software and how much for hardware. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we also want to add a line item for, um, like, BJ? Yeah, I would do that. Oh, yeah. I would do that as well, so that you have consumer yeah. software consulting, consulting, something like that, consulting, okay. so that we can keep track of that better, too. Uh, the next one I had highlighted was new equipment and furnishings. I uh, understood the prosecutor's logic. The history shows a little less. I'd be okay. I'd be okay with putting seven fifty or something in there, but um, okay. What do you I, I would agree with the same. So seven fifty on new equipment and furnishings, and then the last one I had marked from the discussion was office equipment. On the next page, um, it looks like historically we do spend that. Uh, I, I'd say there's no request for an increase. I would I would be okay with the 2,500. Okay, and that, maybe we can define the office equipment a little bit a little bit more with maybe um, when you go through and do the computers and, and things. I think that's where the computers should come out of is office equipment. But okay. that is my feeling. But I can discuss yeah. that with them and Dougie as well. Yeah. So we can wrap that into mm -hmm. hardware yeah. and then software and then computer consultant something like that. And then your equipment would be like chairs or, mm -hmm. or yeah, office machines furnishings. or you can say office furnishings, furnishings and stuff. instead of um, just a so are we taking then perhaps the new equipment line which is eight hundred and combining it with the office equipment line which is eight oh six would that be the contemplation is to just merge those and then we would pull out computers and put them in computer hardware or off. How, how would we want to do that? Because office equipment's the same thing. Right. Right? If you look at office equipment. Well, let me go through the be. other line items off of other departments mm -hmm. to see where there's, so that we get it consistent because it's. I don't think we've been consistent. I don't yeah. think any of the pieces have been consistent. That I'm not, you know, I would suggest I kind of left it the way they the were, but it, the the not, definitions are not yeah. been consistent. Yeah. And 800 yeah. should just maybe be furnishings. Huh. Maybe 800 should just be furnishings. Okay. And then new equipment would be like computers. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because we'll get a definition and then put out a memo to okay. everyone what okay. the definitions are. Because, mm -hmm. what falls under yes, yes, because yes. I think that it needs be to be defined a little better for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with Dave on that one too, that we got it counted by if it's computers. So then if you get us the new definitions, maybe then we'll take those three line items and we'll reallocate them back sure. to your new definitions. Sure. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we'll work on that. I just think it needs to be defined a little better. Yeah. For for the county. Mm -hmm. yeah, on all. all right, Mr. Prosecutor, did I miss anything? I don't think so. Well, I know that I, I know there was some regarding the in kind off the stock grant. Yeah. And you're we'll not jumping that one. Yeah, we're, I know you're not happy with that, but I have to explain what I'm doing so that you understand. Good. Because when the grant was originally started here in the county by Keisha, that grant I. She came over, we agreed, I got an administrative cost because it's costing the county itself money to run these grants. It's costing the county's clerk's time, the payroll clerk's time, Terry's time. And we have, when we're writing grants and doing grants, we have to take that into consideration because it's adding work on, plus it's adding supplies on. That's a big key because you're writing checks, you're doing this, you're doing that. These grants have not been addressed with that type of administrative cost. And that's why I'm charging your office because it's 
this stop grant is only to your advantage in the whole county, basically. I mean, your department. But yet, other departments are handling that stop grant. So I'm just trying to pick up my supplies in little time I get, because it should be a charge to your to your department. I'm not saying anything about the grant match regarding the grant itself, but when that, I think that was redone in July, or the grant match. Um, it was just recently. Just, that, just recently and see, no one even year. came and asked me about what I think should my charge be regarding mm -hmm. that in kind because it's costing this county. That's where I'm coming from. So no one came and asked me even when it was re redone. So I'm so it, going. The stop grant is renewed every year. Yeah, exactly. And, and so should, we should come in on every grant that we have because the, the, you guys are running a lot of grants. But to this county, it's costing the county more time, more supplies, and it's just coming out of everyone else's budgets. So my question would be like, when I ask you how many hours you would put into the stop grant, your hours have decreased my hours, yeah, but would this amount include your hours as match? And then out of those See, match... See, I, I wasn't even going with a match. I was just trying to basically get my supplies back for Carrie and myself. And, but I, that's how I matched it, was took a match off of your grant. You know, just that one quarter, I think it was. Or, because we're losing money off of this, Ben. These grants, we're losing money. The county is. Because we're we're not getting any administrative costs or any supplies or any time. And it's only... I would, I would vehemently disagree that the county is losing money off of the grants. And that could be a point that you and I just agree to disagree. I look at the amount of money that's brought in from a grant and the services that are provided to the county constituents because of the grant. And I would say it's a huge net benefit. If there are incidental costs in administering yes. the grant, I think providing us with a detailed itemized schedule of where those costs are incurred will enable our office to account for that component. It's my understanding that currently much of the administrative components of the stop grant is actually being performed by flow right now. And so trying to understand if our $6,400 is offsetting supplies, I would need to see where those that supplies are That was from your guys' match I got it off of. Now, I'll agree that, um, but the, the stop grant was put in in the month of June, June, for the end of June, for the last quarter. It's supposed to come up to my office first. And then I go in to the state. I match it with my general ledger, and then I go into the state. So we do quarterly reports. Right. So, and they're due around the 10th of every, a 10th of the quarter. So January, February, March is due April 10th, mm -hmm. uh, so on and so forth. If we get behind and we can't make that deadline, I contact the state and say, hey, I can't get my reports to you. Can I have an extension? They say yes, and then I start working on them, depending on what's happening in our office. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, those this last month it was a little delayed. Um, I got the okay from stop. They're not worried about it, so on and so forth. I then prepare all what my financials. I mm -hmm. believe they are, and I send them to you. Right. Um, and, and then I go through them. Yes, and you go my through time. them. I haven't gotten your time, so then I can't use that number as a match. Mm -hmm. So, the only thing that Stop Grant has allowed us to use for match is just our time. And so, see, and, and like I said, I'm a cost accountant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, my question would be on some of the, like the Stop Grant. Now, we got another component coming in, would be Colleen doing the written um, information for the Stop Grant. Prior, it was Keisha doing it. My question is, how do I allocate Colleen's time? 
because she's not getting paid for that at this point. So we're tr what I'm trying to do is get a fine line of what's really happening between all of this because it's not happening correctly. You got ad interns, I believe, that you kind of hired, you know, and you put put an overdraft, and it is bottom line. But in a new budget, should we have that in there? Then, and I'm just questioning because I'm trying to get a handle on what's really going on. I had to understand that interns do have to work some time on a, like a freebie thing, and then it's reported. So that's typically how I work my interns in the office, because I require them to have an educational component. So their training, they don't get compensated for. Whereas but, a typical employee would come into the county, and if I'm training a new employee, okay. they're on the clock. Okay, so that's what my question is. If they're coming in and working those hours, shouldn't we be capturing that on our state insurance fund? See, that's... When, like a volunteer program mm -hmm. out there, we have to uh, count for the hours and then we pay for it off the workman's comp. You know, that component. So, are these people coming up for and volunteering or putting time in and not getting paid for? Um, when you say putting time in, putting, I think that that's a key point that probably needs clarification because that's they're putting what I, time in. To, is an educational piece. So I can send them home with a book and say, I want you to read 50 pages of this book at home in bed tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to start reading. That's not time that the county is paying them for, even no. though it's necessary training for me to then put them in the courtroom the next day and have them handle a case on whatever topic so, or so, subject. So you can see what I want to make sure we're covered on top of these things, not knowing the components of all this. So that's why I, my, I'm questioning. <laughs> You just got to let me know what you want. Yes. So if you say, shoot me an email, hey, Ben, can you provide me with the hours that it, your interns are doing X and give me a definition of what okay. you want to know, and, and I can provide that in okay. for you. So that that's what, why I'm kind of questioning if we've got everything covered within our stuff, you know, on, in the back on the payroll items, because I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so we have this... this. So you're talking about the state workman's comp? We have to be equipped. Yeah. Comp. Yeah. Well, see if if they, and see this is what I don't understand. Not knowing what the program really is about is if they're coming in now. I know they're getting paid twenty five dollars an hour coming in to the office. Is that correct? Right. So then someone told me, well, they come in and they work so many hours they get paid the twenty five. But then they are volunteering some hours for their classes that they're taking that's volunteer hours within the, within the office. So if they're within the office doing volunteer or studying and they're not getting paid for that, but you're reporting it, shouldn't that match my workman's comp? I Do guess I'm you, confused because I don't know where we're reporting it to. Well, I mean, that, typically, we're not reporting that. You're, you're not signing anything off of their educational stuff? No, that's oh, okay. between them and their school. Okay. Well, see, uh, when you said interns, I'm not sure how your program's working okay. because on an intern office. If you're talking about an intern and an extern, and they're very different things, we don't have any extern from them. Okay. But we have had externs, and yeah. right now well, one of our judges that's working... Uh, her our magistrate judge is doing an externship, mm -hmm. so she is getting school credit for her hours. Oh, so that's a, it's, there's a difference. That's so see, that's why we're trying to define what you got going on. Now, I hate to interrupt all this, but we oh, got sorry. another budget meeting that should have started a bit ago. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I think probably the last item that we are on, and I don't know if we've got any result for it or what the BOCC wants to do with it, but it's going to be 430-0013, and that's the stop grant expense in kind, which is reflected as an expense on the prosecutor's budget. So I don't know what you guys want to do with that. Obviously, you've heard input from the clerk, you've heard input from my office. Um, there's some disagreement as to that component, and I don't know how we work through it. So I'd like to, I would like to uh, have more information on that before we before we make the final decision so we can do that later. I mean, what, yeah. What like information do you need? Huh? What information do you need? Oh. Um, to, to be able to see what what she's talking about is uh, an expense. I don't understand what... 
it's an expense to his office because the the stop grants is benefiting his office entirely throughout the county. That 6,400 would come back into an income into county general, which can be dispersed between all the other offices that are handling the stock grant. But does the, will the stock grant even allow that? That's that's the whole thing. It's got it's nothing to do with the stock grant. It's got. It doesn't sound like it's being built out for the stock grant. It's just being built out to my office's budget. For managing the stock grant. For managing the component. Which would be different than a scenario where perhaps a grant is paying for it. was paying for it. That's what so I was wondering. The grant is paying for the admin, then that that's what I would say it would be all right. The grant's paying for the admin, but but the taxpayers to pay for the admin. So what would be your suggestion? I want to look into it further. That's what I want to do. And you want to put it on the next week agenda? Yes, put it on next week agenda. Yeah. Okay, because I want to understand why I don't want to understand. So, because I that was my question. Was the grant name board just had it to my So, but like we're out of time. Yeah. Want to put it in that? Oh. Yeah. We could put it in that. Want to put it in that time block that we have yeah. for Tuesday? Yeah. And what supplies okay. and costs are associated with that? Well, right. So we will take it back up next next week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we gave you some answers today. So we're yeah. we're game. All right, I'm sorry to have to end this, but we're cutting into the public works budget time. And I have to run upstairs and get We're adjourned? Yeah, so we're adjourned.